So is this the old? Ah, no, this one is not missing. So we talked about various addition algorithms yesterday. Very fancy sounding. I mean, not yesterday. You know what I mean? Last time we met. So we're going to cheat with that. Um, so these are ways to do addition that are not lining up the faces and going through and carrying and doing all of the stuff of the standard algorithm. We're going to start with kind of a list of tricks. Adding from the left. I'll bet this is what most of us do if we're ever called upon to add a two-digit number mentally, like 47 plus 31. I would say, let's see, well, 40 plus 30 is 70, and then 77, we've got 178. So adding from the left is the idea that you add the tens place of the second number. First, then you add the ones face. So I did that verbally, but the idea here is that if you had forty seven and thirty one. Well, 47 plus 30 should be relatively easy to do in your head. It's 77. And then we've got that stray one. We add it, we get 78. Um, the real advantage of doing this, adding from the left instead of the right, and again, I remind you that adding from the right, as it were, is, sorry, you are? Rose. Ah, pleased to meet you, Rose. Um, adding from the right, as it were, is when you have to do carrying, and that's sort of inconvenient if you're doing stuff mentally. So it didn't come up there. But what about 47 and 58? To pick a relatively challenging example. Well, if you added the seven and the eight First, you'd have a 15, and then you'd have to remember, okay, we've got an extra one in our tens column. The point of adding from the left is to try to not have to do any carrying when we're doing this addition. 47 plus 50, is 97, 97 plus 8. This may be a little tricky, actually. I think um, 7 plus 8 is one of the sums that kids traditionally struggle with, but 
If nothing else, we could just count up 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105. So again, we did not add the eight and the seven um, first to avoid having to carry. Okay. The second in this list of tricks is oh that's the these two things are so similar. Everything that I wrote on the board is correct. Except that this is what the book calls breaking up and bridging. So, 47 plus 30, and then you have a one. What? We're going to call, uh, oops, let's get rid of that. So what we're going to call adding from the left is dealing with the ones columns and the tens columns totally separately. So that's not quite what we did here when we added 47, um, I mean, we added 47 plus 30. So we had both the tens column of the 47 and the ones column of the 47. It was only the 30 that we broke up. Adding from the left is just totally breaking everything up. 67 plus 36. Well, 60 plus 30 is 90, 7 plus 6 is 13, 90 plus 13 is 103, or sort of the, the point of doing this is to try to do it in your head, so but writing everything down just so that it's clear what we're doing. Again, we add the tens. We add the ones. And again, the point of doing this is so that you don't have to carry anything. If you add the tens first, you'll have a zero here. So whatever number you have here, there's no risk that you'll have to carry when you do this sum. Three and zero is three. Nine and one is 10. Continuing, it's, it's quite a quite a list. Well, we're about halfway through. Trading off, as the book calls it. is a little less elegant to me because it requires you to sort of, if you're thinking of this as a mental algorithm, it requires you to keep 
track of multiple things at once. But it's basically doing both addition and subtracting. It's saying, okay, it's saying, okay, we start with the 67, let's do addition. And let's just count up for a moment. 67, 68, 69, 70. Okay, 70 is a nice number. It's nice in the sense that it has a zero in the one space. So we count it up by three to get to 70. We started with 36, but we've already used three of those to get to 70. So that leaves us with 33. And then this is, again, this is a nice addition. Um, if you lined it up, I mean, the point of these mental tricks is hopefully you're not lining stuff up. But the reason I call this a nice addition, it's the same reason I call this a nice addition. Having this zero here means we're never going to have to carry any numbers in our heads. That's going to be three. That's going to be 103. And I think, I mean, you have all of these lists of tricks. I think in terms of stuff that people actually use, I'll bet a lot of people do do trading off. I mean, I do trading off sometimes. And these tricks are the kind of what you might call general tricks that you can always do. Um, in theory, you could even use these tricks if you had bigger numbers. Like if you had thousands, you could still add the thousands place, add the hundreds place, at the tens place, at the ones place. You could still do adding from the left. It's just that if you are doing this with thousands, now you're trying to keep track in your head of all of this stuff. What's the thousands place? What's the hundreds place? And at some point you have to ask, well, wouldn't it be easier to just drag my phone out and not do this mentally? Yeah. So this works well for two-digit numbers once you start getting more digits than that. It's really maybe, maybe mental math, mental arithmetic isn't the way to go. But these are sort of tricks of the trade. And again, I assume that all of us in, our, in this room can do the addition. The point here is that, you know, if you're, as I always say, and it's true that this isn't a pedagogy class, it's content, but knowing different techniques that you're expected to be able to teach, is content. So there are a few other things that the book bumps in with breaking up and bridging and the rest, but these are really more specialized and don't always work. Also, the situation where you use compatible numbers is different from when you would be using breaking up and bridging and the rest. So 
compatible numbers is a trick for when you're adding three or more numbers together. Let's say 130 and 50 and 70 and 20 and 50. And although this gets phrased as a mental math trick, it's something I do even when I'm working pen and paper. And compatible numbers is, comes from looking at a list like this and saying, well, some of these additions are really easy, right? Like we see a 50 and a 50. I can do that, no problem. 50 times 50 plus 50, sorry, is going to give us 100. So we'll take those 50s and turn them into 100. And then we've got 130 and 170. Well, 30 and 70 go together well. They make a hundred. One hundred thirty and seventy make two hundred. And then you've got this spare twenty kind of floating around. So two hundred and one hundred is three hundred. Three hundred and twenty. I've done this many times, adding up student grades. I should, I, I always, uh, go maybe a little too fast in this fast. Does anybody have any questions? Then I feel like maybe the textbook is a little over enthusiastic with this list. I'm going to include making compatible numbers because it's listed as a separate thing in the textbook. But it's basically just trading off, give it a different name. Let's say you're asked to do something like 79 and 25. Well, it's manageable. But making compatible numbers says, well, 79 is not a nice number to work with. 80 would be a nicer number. We count up from 79 to 80. 25 becomes a 24. Alternatively, and maybe this is what the textbook thinks the difference is. When we traded off, we went up. We went from 79 to 80. Yeah. 
Making compatible numbers says, well, 79 is only a little more than 75. And 75 plus 25, that would be nice. That would just be 100. So let's think of 79 as being 75 and then a little bit extra. 79 is 75 and 4. Well, now, if you want to add 25, the 75 and the 25 turn into 100. We have that 4 left. So now that I have this written down, um, the difference between this and trading off is becoming clearer to me. Trading off is addition to make something nice. Making compatible numbers is basically subtraction to make something nice. It's saying, well, 79 is a little bigger than a nice number, so we'll break it up and then use the nice number. So this is all, I mean, Mendel arithmetic, it's all fine. The reality is that most of the time when you're doing Mendel arithmetic, um, you're going to be doing some kind of estimation. Like, Think when you would do this. It's probably in the store most of the time. You'd like to roughly know how much your groceries are going to cost before you get everything rung up. And the store, the prices are going to be decimals and something's going to cost $7.99 instead of $8. And you're probably not going to care about those finer details. If something costs $7.99, so just say, okay, this costs $8. And this thing that costs $3.95, that's $4. So a lot of real world mental math is done via estimation. And we haven't introduced decimals yet. Um, so stuff like $8.99 we can't deal with. But we can start thinking about it. and say, okay, what if we have four numbers and we want to add them together, but we don't really care about the finer details. We just want a general estimation. And it's our day for the presenting a list of techniques. Um, because that's what the textbook does here. It says, okay, if we want to estimate, here are a few things you could do. And in spite of these fancy names we're giving them, These are sometimes a little fuzzy, as you might expect, because they're estimation techniques, and estimation is a kind of fuzzy thing.
But let's say we want to add some numbers together, and this works better than the previous techniques did with like three or more numbers. But, you know, we don't really care about the exact number. We are, you know, planning an event and we're looking at how many students are coming from different schools. And we really just want to know, okay, approximately how many students are we going to have here? Is it thousands? Is it hundreds? You know, maybe some students who say they'll come won't. Maybe some students who say they won't come will. It's useless to get an exact number. We just want an approximate. Well, the front end in this front end with adjustment comes from the idea that, okay, we're working with hundreds here. So we certainly don't want to be off by a factor of a hundred. Let's take those hundreds seriously. Let's add them up properly. 400, 700, 1200. And then these other numbers, and this is where the adjustment comes from. We don't want to take them as seriously as we take the 100s, but we certainly don't want to ignore them. I mean, 80 is a large number. 80, 60 is a large number. Let me actually modify this slide. That's 567. So we look at these numbers and we round them. We say, okay, well, 23 is about 20. 80 is 80. 67, that's about 70. 8 and 2 is 10. Plus 7 is 17. So we have about 170. Well, as a matter of fact, due to a complete fluke of rounding, in this case, we are getting the exact correct answer. But the important thing is that we take the front numbers, the front digits, we add them up properly, everything else we round. Example two. Let's say we have thousands instead of hundreds. Um, well, this 1,000 and this 1,000 and this 2,000 are important. We just, we want to just take them seriously. We don't want to do any estimation here. We want to add those up properly and get 4,000. And I said that this estimation technique has fuzziness in it. And the fuzziness comes in how you do the rounding. Um, we could round to the nearest 10, for example. We could say, well, this is about 90, and this is about 10, and we'll add those together, and we'll get 100. 
Or if we care less about the fine details, maybe we round to the nearest hundred. And we'll say, well, this is about 500 and this is about 100. So it's not an exact science. It's all, well, how precise do we need to be? We rounded to the nearest 10. We'd get 1,200. And we'd say, well, this is about 5,200. I am cursed with making up these mental examples that don't do exactly what I want them to do. Ordinarily, rounding to different numbers of digits is going to change your estimation. Here, we once again just lined up with 1,200. So we get the same approximation of 5,200 in both cases. So the next, I, mean, I guess you don't strictly need more than two numbers, but grouping is a technique for when you're adding a bunch of numbers together and they all look pretty similar. And I mean, you as a teacher, we do this all the time, like looking at test grades or something, and we say, okay, these test grades are all around 70, the class had about a 70% average, without worrying that actually some of the test grades are 74 and others are 68. We just look at them, we say, well, these are about 70. Grouping is when you are adding a bunch of numbers together. Bustering, the second time today that I had to change a name. Sorry about that. But clustering is when you're adding a bunch of numbers together and you look at them and you say, well, these numbers are close enough. Then we'll just treat them all as being basically the same number. And because estimation is sort of by definition not an exact science, what we mean by close enough is not something we can formally define. But like if we looked at these numbers, we might say, uh, these numbers are around 6,000. We have one number that's pretty significantly above 6,000. That's this 6,512. But we also have one number that's pretty significantly below it. That's this 5,522. So let's assume that that's going to sort of cancel itself out.
and we have about five, six thousands. I mean, as a technique for teaching elementary school students, I'm a little fuzzy about how this works, because presumably, if they're still teaching addition, they don't know how to do a multiplication, but if you've decided that these are all about 6,000 and you have five of them, that's 6,000 times five. These should add up to about 30,000. Any questions? at this point. Then the similarly name, so similarly that I unfaded them, but the similarly named grouping comes from when, again, We're adding a bunch of stuff up. And grouping is basically a combination of rounding and then a previous, where was it? Rounding and compatible numbers. So grouping is looking at this and saying, well, We've got a bunch of numbers. They're kind of ugly. 64 is kind of close to 60, though. And 39 is kind of close to 40. And 60 and 40 are a nice sum. 60 and 40 are 100. And then... 32 and 23, well, 32 is pretty close to 30. 23 is pretty close to 20. So that's pretty close to 50. And then 49 is pretty close to 50. So this is pretty close to 200. Now, the other technique that we want to talk about is probably the one that people, I mean, you tell people to do estimation by grouping, they can't because, I mean, I mean, they can understand the concept but this is just something our textbook makes up, or maybe it appears in multiple textbooks, but it's not in the public consciousness, as it were. On the other hand, I think pretty much everyone has some idea what rounding is. So rounding as an estimation technique is pretty straightforward. You round the individual semantics, you round the things you're adding together, and then you get simpler numbers that you add up. Rounding can be very I mean, how accurate it is, is going to depend on what you round to. So, 1,439 plus 2,100. 
hundred ten. If you decided to round to the nearest thousand, you'd get one hundred, sorry, one thousand plus two thousand is three thousand. I mean, that's a pretty bad estimate. Well, I say it's a pretty bad estimate. You know, whether an estimate is good or bad depends on what you need it for. But it's off by about 500. And 500 is what? It's off by a factor of about a six. So for most purposes, I think, you know, maybe instead of rounding to the nearest thousand, we want to round to the nearest hundred. Then you get a better approximation. Of course, kind of the trade-off is that the um, how should I put this? The more accurate your rounding is, the closer you are to just be doing the sum and not an approximation. I mean, we could go even further than that instead of rounding to the nearest hundred, we could round to the nearest 10. And now your approximation's even better, but at this point, I mean, why not just round to the nearest one and just do the addition exactly and get the exact answer? I mean, it's all going to depend on, you know, what the numbers are, but of the of the approximations that are on the whiteboard, I'd say that pleases me the most. I think that strikes a good balance between being quick and easy on the one hand and being relatively accurate on the other. Um, rounding also, I mean, the reason that rounding to the nearest thousand works kind of badly here is that everything rounded down. If you had some things round down and some things round up, that error might sort of cancel itself out and rounding to the nearest thousand might be more viable, but but that's round, a messy process. And it's messy because you have, because in spite of in one sense being very straightforward, you have to make decisions about what to round to. And it's not always clear what decision you should make. But at this point, then we have a few estimation techniques. Grouping is kind of specialized, or rather cluster, I keep, you know, a group and a cluster, they're synonyms, I can't help it. But clustering is rather specialized. You need the numbers to be close together. Grouping is also kind of specialized because you need your numbers to make nice sums. 
You know, I had that number that was sort of close to 60 and that number that was sort of close to 40. If instead of that, I had a number that was sort of close to 20, the clustering wouldn't have worked as well. The grouping wouldn't have worked as well. So that leaves us with front end addition with adjustment and rounding as the non specialized techniques that you can use in any situation. And at 10.47, it seems like we are about done. I'll see you Friday and get you homework on Friday as well.